Let's continue in a study of the severe conflict that was going on here between the religious establishment and Jesus. And so we look at John 1.17 that says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And religion typically likes to seem to downplay this as though this is not a statement of confrontation and of things that are contrary and opposite one another. That it's probably presented as though the law was given by Moses and then later on in the dispensation of the church age a revelation of grace was given by Jesus Christ. And then that full revelation was completely revealed to Paul. That's one of the common interpretations that I've heard of what this means. But this is a statement of war and the book of John in which that is in the prologue is very much a book of conflict between Jesus and the religious establishment. And this is actually throughout the entire New Testament. Not even just the Gospel and, and Acts accounts, but all of it is a statement of conflict and confrontation between the religious establishment and the New Testament writers, apostles, disciples. And primarily what it is, is a confrontation between two opposing ways of thinking. And on one side, you have valuing people by their performance. What have you done for me lately? You're as good as your most memorable performance, which might not even be your most recent one. It might be the one you had 25 years ago, and we've just never moved past that in our view of you. And another is a view that says, your value is inherent and is infinite and can never be taken away. It can't be subtracted. It can't be added to. All people are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, the only answer that religion can have to all people being equal is to make them evil, equally evil and disgusting and putrid, wicked sinners. So, the satanic doctrine of total depravity and original sin and inherent evil and of Adamic nature, that satanic way of interpretation is the only way religion can make all people equal is to just bring everybody down to being despicable, disgusting, sinful worms. But the message of grace is exactly opposite that. It says that you are the pearl of great price. It says that you are of such great value. You are worth dying for. You're worth giving everything for. That's what love is, is to give of yourself that another might be fulfilled. And fulfilled means to achieve your highest potential. So to give yourself in order that someone else might achieve their highest potential. You know, that requires you to value them. And religion's only answer to people being equal is to make them equally depraved. But that's the opposite way of looking at things. So there's a conflict here. Where on one hand, you have a worldview that says, you're as good as your performance. And that's what all law is. All law makes up rules, and how well you keep those rules, whether those are do's or don'ts, and do's are just as important in religion as don'ts. Um, how well you keep those rules is how important you are. That's how valued you are. That's what your social status ends up being. That's how well you're esteemed. You are as good as your performance. And you are as bad as your performance. And that doesn't even necessarily even need to be a fair assessment. We can just cling to some performance that was particularly egregious to us. You know, something that we find particularly offensive. And that will be your performance. And then on the other hand, you have a, a value that is inborn. That all people are in the likeness and the image of God. Not all people are totally depraved, wicked, disgusting, filthy sinners but that all people are in the likeness and image of God, that in him all things consist, and without him was nothing made that was made. So, what you have here is this, this intense conflict, 
And when you understand the intense conflict that is happening, then the way that you can receive the text and interpret the text starts to change from this kind of... I feel like flat is the best word to describe it. That there's this idea like like everything is equal in terms of the way it's presented. Everything is just the way it, it looks. And there's no emotion applied to it. And there's no rules of rhetoric applied to it. People don't have conversations the way that we have conversations. People don't use rhetoric the way that we use rhetoric. People don't use hyperbole the way that we use hyperbole. There's no taunting. There's no sarcasm. There's no saying something in order to illustrate how silly it is. Um, these are things that we actually do. And these are things that are in the text, but aren't read into the text because the conflict has been stripped of it, which is really bizarre. Because we're talking about Jesus Christ here, a person whose most notable contribution to society is hanging on a cross. Um, you know, you, you walk into many churches, they, they display it, whereas they show Jesus hanging on the cross, and that's their, their image that they're presenting to people. His most notable contribution is hanging on a cross. And, you know, that's not something you do because you've had a minor disagreement. That is something you do. He was brutally tortured and murdered in one of the most cruel and brutal and inhumane means possible. One of the most disgusting ways ever invented to kill somebody. That's what he was subjected to. The amount of hatred and violence that is, uh, that is involved in that is astounding. And so... Downplaying this conflict is doing a grave disservice to your understanding of what's going on. And as you understand the conflict, you start to see the sarcasm. You see the taunts. You see how something is, is an illustration of silliness. You see how somebody is, you know, something that's written there is written there so that you go, wow, that sounds stupid. And so that you can reevaluate your way of thinking about things. A lot of things are done in parables and in metaphors and in illustrations so that instead of just saying, look, here's, here's where your doctrine is wrong because you're not going to receive that. You're, the way that people think, they're just going to openly reject something if all you do is just say, here's where you're wrong, here's, here's the correct doctrine. What you need to do is lead people to think for themselves and to, to sort it out and to work on it on their own. And that's what the purpose of parables was. So anyway, we're going to continue exploring this generation of vipers that Jesus was confronted with and the violent conflict that was taking place that ultimately resulted in his murder. And so, oh, I'm switching the wrong thing here. So let's back up again a little bit and we see um, here in there we go. Luke 4, as we discussed in the previous, that um, he Jesus took the vengeance away from God when he read the passage from Isaiah. And the people became infuriated. And we get down to verse 28, and it says, And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill whereupon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. And then it says in verse 32, and they were astonished at his doctrine for his word was with power. And astonished is, it means bewildered. It means, it, it often means confused. The way that it's being used here is that it's, it's actually to be infuriated. They're, they're angry at what he's saying, or at the very least confused. It's not consistent with, with, with what they've always always known and the religion that they've been taught. So he's teaching something contrary. And in this case, what he did was he took vengeance away from God. And that has really infuriated them to the point of wanting to throw him off a cliff, um, which takes a great deal of fury. In fact, I kind of was thinking about this as I was sitting in a Bible study and thinking, you know, I can imagine people getting angry at something someone's saying if, if you know, say a visitor was, was speaking. 
I can imagine people sitting and getting angry, disagreeing, maybe even saying, you know, get out, or even maybe coming to, you know, a couple, throwing a few punches or something. But I can't imagine the entire group getting together and, and trying to drive the person off of a cliff. I mean, the amount of rage that's involved in that is is something I have a hard time even understanding um, to, to, to get to that point where they wanted to throw him off of a cliff. But the point is to say that they were astonished at his doctrine. And this is a deeper study to go in that they were astonished at his doctrine. But we go to now in Mark chapter 11. And this is where, here, okay, verse 15. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temples, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves? And the scribes and chief priests heard it, and they sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. So the, this was creating disorder, where people, you know, he was, he was teaching contrary to the religion as it was commonly promoted. And ultimately, what he was really doing was he was he was coming against the law of Moses, which is a performance evaluation. You are as good as how well you keep the law of Moses. And so the better you are at keeping the law of Moses, the, the better person you are. And that couples together with a understanding or a teaching that says that those who are afflicted are afflicted because they are accursed of God or because they are sinners or they've done something wrong or their parents have done something wrong. And you add that on top of, for example, say a blind person has no functional contribution that they could make to their society in that time. In that time, I want to just want to emphasize that. Um, and that was added to the perception that not only is this person a useless drain on our society, but it's God who has cursed this person for something they've done or their parents have done. So they're not merely useless, they're accursed of God. So the, the way that the less fortunate were treated was that they deserved what they had. They were getting what they deserved. They had earned it. It was a penalty being inflicted upon them by God for some reason or another. And so there was really no reason to help these people. And this is what is the opposite when you have the opposite mentality that all people are equal and that those who are in less fortune are merely in a state of being in less fortune. You know, in a state of being whatever. That then what you have that might be able to help them. You want to help them because they're as equally as important as anybody else. There is no discrepancy where you're blessed and they're cursed. It's that you're blessed in a different way and your blessing can become their blessing. That you pour out rivers of living water. That you pour out what it is that you have and you help those people. And so this is not a, a popular way of seeing. So he had a new doctrine. And I think the best illustration of what this new doctrine is, is here in Luke chapter 6. And so we go to verse 27. And it says, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men would do to you, do ye also to them likewise. 
For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive much gain. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So this is the new doctrine, and, and one of the key points here is not expecting a return for what you do. You don't do good to get good. You don't do to get. This is where you do because those who you can do for are in need. And furthermore, is is one of the key points here, you shall be children of the highest by loving your enemies and hoping for nothing again when you lend. So it's not ye shall be children of the highest because you make the correct confession of faith and get baptized in water or whatever is the correct method for your denomination and have the right doctrine on Trinity and correct, uh, uh, have all your doctrinal ducks in a row and, you know, don't watch Hollywood movies and whatever else it is that your, your weird doctrinal laws have been crafted in traditions of men. It doesn't say that's how you shall be children of the highest. It says, love your enemies and you shall be children of the highest. So it has nothing to do with doctrine or confessions or religious rituals. It has to do with how you treat those who mistreat you. It has to do with how you treat those who are in need as well. And here's, here's a mind blower. So in, in the Luke 4 episode we went through and they wanted to throw him off a cliff, it's because he took vengeance away from God. Here he is, he's saying that God is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. That is just, <laughs> that's heretical. <laughs> just blatantly put, put it that way. That's heretical. But that's what Jesus said. So when you understand that there's a conflict going on here, you understand that he's kind of throwing this in their face. Like, you know, here here's the way that you've been told, but I'm telling you that that's all wrong. The way you had it is, is all distorted you've you've put all your faith in keeping of religious rituals and thinking that's what makes you righteous when what makes you righteous is to be kind to one another and to love one another and even when people aren't going to return it to you just that's that's how to be that's the way to <laughs> that's the way to demonstrate that you're the children of God is to be merciful as your Father also is merciful, in verse 36. Be therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Not as your Father also is intolerant and revengeful. It says, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. I mean, that's, that's the new doctrine. So that is what is in contrast, contrary to the law of Moses, where you are righteous as how well you keep the rules. And this isn't new rules to follow. This isn't replacement rules to follow. This is an entirely new way of thinking where you understand that you're not valued based on performance. You're valued based on being children of God. You're valued based on being born equal. So one thing to look at here is things that Jesus said that were confrontational. And so there's many things that he said about this generation. And the generation is the generation 
that he's talking to, the, the religious leadership, the people that he's talking to, the people that are right there, right in front of him as he's speaking. And that's this generation. And so we look at what he has to say about this generation here, Matthew 3, 7, that was John the Baptist calling them the generation of vipers. But that's also something here in Matthew 12, 34, O generation of vipers, that Jesus said. So he called them a generation of vipers. He called them, Matthew 12, 39, an evil and adulterous generation. And then he goes on a, a, on a tirade about how this generation, this generation, this generation. So keep in mind when he says this generation, he's talking about the people sitting in front of him, the people standing in front of him, the people hearing the sound of his voice. Um, Matthew 12, 45, this wicked generation. So what, what generation is wicked? This wicked generation, the one that murdered him, the one that put him on a cross, that's the wicked generation. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. What generation? The one that put him on a cross. Matthew 17, 17, gener Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation. Who's a faithless and perverse generation? The one that put him on a cross. Matthew 23, 33, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? So he's talking to the people that are there. He's not fortune-telling. Um, so when we get to Matthew 23 and 24, and he says, all these things shall come upon this generation. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. What generation? The one that is wicked and adulterous. The one that is faithless and perverse. The one that can hear the sound of his voice. The one that put him on a cross and murdered him brutally. That generation. This generation is that generation. Not this generation. Not 2019 generation. The one that heard the sound of his voice and nailed him to a cross. That generation. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And so then we see much repetition because there are things repeated throughout the, the gospel messages where there's, there's many similar repetitions of things. Mark 8, 38, this adulterous and sinful generation. Mark 9, 19, O oh, faithless generation. Mark 13.30, again, talking about the, the uh, eschatology there. Verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Luke 3.7, we have John the Baptist again saying, O generation of vipers, another account of that. Luke 7.31, where until shall I like the men of this generation? And to what are they like? And here we're going to dig in a little further. It says, They are like unto the children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man, and a wine-bibber, and a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. So, when you go to passages like the rich young ruler and he says good master remember that they said he was gluttonous and a drunk and a friend of publicans and sinners so when he says why do you call me good I don't think he's objecting to being called good I think he's objecting to the fact that he knows full well that they're trying to ensnare him in a trap of getting him to openly reject the law of Moses and every time we'll, we'll look over this but every time that someone comes to him and, and says good master and he says why do you call me good they're asking him about the law they're always challenging him on his, his opinion of the law and he responds every time by saying well you know the law <laughs> so he doesn't fall for it um so here they are, they say, Behold a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. And then, we, as we also saw previously, in John eight forty one, they said to him, We be not born of fornication. So, when you go to the book of Hebrews, and it says, you know, that 
a father chastens his son. This is a response that this is one of those things that you'll understand better when you understand the conflict that's taking place. So you have people following Jesus and those who are on the law of Moses side are saying, why are you following this drunk, gluttonous bastard who has died a curse of God, a blasphemer who died a curse of God, and the proof is that he was hanging on a tree after being scourged? So it's, this is a response, throwing it back in their face, saying, you know, well, what son's not chastised by his father? You're the bastards. That's They're, they're turning it around. It's not a theological statement saying, well, God scourges. That's sick. God does not scourge you. It's just a response to the taunt, the mockery of saying, you're following some bastard, drunk, glutton, blasphemer that died hanging on a tree accursed of God that's what the, the passage in Hebrews is a response to being mocked that way it is not a statement of how God does business it's just a response to that and that's the kind of thing that when you have that conflict stripped out of what's going on you don't see it and it doesn't make sense to you to think that you're reading anything other than some statement that gives you an understanding of how God functions. It's not an understanding of how God functions. It's a response that is the result of a war that is being waged between two different philosophies and two different ways of perceiving the fellow man. It's those who are downtrodden, rising up in rebellion against the, the establishment. This is a war that's taking place. And if you don't see it that way, you'll look at these things and you'll think that these are theological statements when they're not. Because you won't see the language for what it actually is. You won't see the conflict for what it is. And that's why this is, this is so important. So, <laughs> so, you know, if if you're receptive to it, he said, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And I suggest to you that Moses looked around, and he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no man, he slew an Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So their father was Moses. And I'll just leave that hanging there. And you can figure out whether you like that or not.